Lord God, one of the great hymns of our faith says that when we reach you, we will not be strangers or guests, but like children at home. Lead us onward toward that abiding home with you, both here and now and then and there. This we ask in the name of love. Amen. I may not look it, but I'm 31 years old. For 31, I feel that I've had the honor and the privilege to accomplish so much in my life. I've had the opportunity to mingle with world leaders and celebrities. I've advanced social causes that I'm passionate about and pursued an education to receive a terminal degree. Yet one of my many, many shortcomings uh, that I realize in this stage of my life is that sometimes I can be a little short-sighted. I want justice right now. I want peace right now. I want my cheeseburger plain and I want it right now. (laughs) Unfortunately, in some of those instances, my desire for the change I seek has caused harm to those around me or those I am trying to assist. That said, one of the more harmless bouts of my short-sightedness came in seminary. I chose in my desire to take more preaching classes to forego the biblical languages like Hebrew and Greek. I didn't really need those anyway. (laughs) I think we all do ourselves a little disservice when we're short-sighted. For me, it was not reading scripture in the original language. And no, I'm not talking about the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Today we hear words, though, that I think sometimes are best read in the King's English. We hear words that are so innate to many of us that we know them by heart. Psalm 23, right? It's known as some of the most beautiful lines of Scripture in Judaism and its sibling Christianity. We cling to them in times of despair and sadness. When our soul feels empty, we go to the 23rd Psalm. Many of us have heard those very words at funerals and other times of tragedy as they offer the enveloping love of God as we grieve. In fact, my granddaddy Lee, God love him, has said that Psalm 23 and Amazing Grace are banned at his eventual funeral because they're just overused too much. Overused as they may be in those circumstances, they have also been known to offer beautiful hymnody and literature within our faith. Yet in our English reading of the text, in our English-centric reading of the text, we may have missed something intrinsic within Scripture. This thing is so important, so pressing, so very ingrained in the text for the Hebrew people that it's almost laughable that we miss miss it in English. So then rather me leading you in the dark, myself not having taken biblical languages, I did what any good preacher would do. I called my rabbi friend and had them offer their insights onto the way I have always heard Psalm 23 and what they might offer that might be new. I spoke with multiple rabbinic scholars, which is a big time commitment for a pastor. Many rabbis are not really known for their brevity. Uh, They're indeed known for their wisdom, however, and boy did I find out some things. What I learned will absolutely rock your world. We've all heard the opening refrain, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What we could never glean in our reading of this is that in the Hebrew language, both modern and ancient, there really isn't a to be or is in the present tense of the word. That is to say that when David is writing this psalm, he is saying that this statement is what we would call in grammar a present absolute. Now, what does that mean? The psalm should sound more like this in English. The Lord is always my shepherd. I shall not want. Or even more correctly, if we dial it back and dial it in, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord has been my shepherd. 
The Lord will always be my shepherd. I shall not want. It is that very reality that we glean over in our reading of the text that I hope that we might attach the weight of my sermon to today. The Lord will always be my shepherd. That means that there are other people and things in this world that will one day cease, but the shepherdship of the Lord is ongoing. It's been going on before this church was a thing. It's been going on before any of us were a thing, since before we could recall that reality, that that fact that the Lord is your shepherd is that little voice in your being that caused you to show up to church today. It's that sense of dread when we see things heading towards disarray. It's a reminder that things might get worse between here and there, but we will never go it alone. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. My friend Rabbi Michael Siegel also pointed something out here that I think is important and in tandem with what we hear about the Lord being our shepherd in the 23rd Psalm. Rabbi Siegel notes that the valley of the shadow of death is not, as we Christians have painted, an imaginary vision of sadness and dismay, something that is to come, something to be avoided until we absolutely have to face it. For the Israelite people of David's day, there was a place that could be seen from the holy city of Jerusalem that was called the valley of the shadow of death. Rabbi Siegel's point that he made to me would become clear here. There were observant Jews who felt that God's presence could only be felt or experienced in a temple-like structure that David should build. What David is suggesting is there might not be a temple yet, but God's presence could be felt anywhere. God's presence could be inside and outside the walls of Zion. God could be felt inside and outside the eventual temple. God is here, is what David is trying to say to us. He was loosening the chains that people had placed on God so that we could recognize God even in the places that we once thought impossible. You know, that happened for my mom years ago, and my mom's here today, and I'm so glad that my family got to come. I wanted to share with you a story that that I've heard from her a few times. In the 1980s, my mom was a floor nurse at Iredell Memorial Hospital in a small town outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Throughout the halls of the hospital, there were quiet whispers about a patient that my mom had been assigned to care for. To many in the hospital, he was unlike anything they had yet encountered in their inexperienced, narrow-minded view of the world. This man had AIDS, a disease that was running rampant among gay men and ravaging an already vulnerable community. The man had what had to have been one of the first diagnosed cases in the entire county. And while many thought it dangerous and even ill-advised for him to be cared for by my mom, my mom saw it differently. She knew as a nurse her job was clear. The man would ultimately, as so many did, succumb to the virus, but not before knowing that there was a nurse at a small town hospital in rural North Carolina that saw him as a child of a liberating and loving God. She offered him the best care a nurse could offer. She offered him human touch and concern when others refused and thought it unwise. She made those words, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, jump off the pages of Scripture. And that's the grandest truth of all for us, is that we can go and do likewise. I'm not ignorant to the fact that many of us in this very room are scared for our futures. We see the polling data. We hear the conversations in parlors and the projects at work that are seeking to dial back the clock on the liberties that we all now enjoy. We see our climate 
changing and our world burning and no one seems to care. We see gun violence in our schools and in our churches and our religious centers, and we seem powerless to change the current circumstance because people just aren't listening. We watch as families are torn apart over polarizing issues of the day. They just don't talk to each other anymore. We witness immigrants whose best and highest hope is our broken country being sent back home to certain death because they cannot claim asylum here. It's overwhelming. It's daunting. If you're like me, it's downright anxiety-inducing to think about between now and November. But then those words that we've known for so long start to creep back in as a call to action for all of us. The Lord is my shepherd. Some have suggested that sheep aren't the most intelligent creatures, which makes for an apt comparison for how we often forget the simple truth that God is on our side. The Lord is our shepherd. And you know something about sheep? They only follow one shepherd. You know what that means? The Lord is my shepherd. Donald Trump is not. You know what that means? That the Lord is my shepherd and the family who disowned me, they are not. The Lord is my shepherd, drugs and alcohol are not. The Lord is my shepherd and those finances that are keeping me up at night is not. The Lord is my shepherd and the job prospects that seem slim are not. If the Lord is my shepherd, then those who have judged me throughout my life for who I am or who I love are not. The Lord is my shepherd, then churches that have said I am not enough and are not welcome are not my shepherd. They never were. times like this when our world seems burning and our world may seem falling apart at the seams, but we have a God who is the ultimate seamstress. Our world may be crumbling, but we have this Jesus fellow who comes to us and tells his disciples to collect the crumbs of bread, not as leftovers, but as his very body for a hungry world. It is this God who begs us not to put our trust in the principalities and powers of this world, but rather in the liberating nature of grace, love, and abundance. For the 23rd Psalm is a song of abundance, both of the bounty of God, but also the presence of God. You know, I'm a long-winded preacher. For here, I think. I think. I hope you're okay with it. I'm going to finish up, I promise. I'm getting to where I'm going. Um, there are events in our collective history that you'll remember where you were, what you were doing, and how you felt as you played helpless witness to the events that were unfolding. For previous generations, or for some of you in this room, it might be John F. Kennedy's assassination, or the Challenger explosion, or September 11th, 2001. You remember where you were when you turned on the TV and saw that the world had changed. We could add many more events to that list, I'm sure, but I want to hone in on one moment in history that happened just recently that I've been thinking about a lot lately. On January 6th of 2021, in a rare confluence of events that doesn't happen often, both Stephanie and I were home from work and turned on a television to watch a show. We were quickly captivated as we watched an insurrection spurred by national leaders on the bastion of our democracy, the United States Capitol building. For the first time, literally for the first time in our nation's history, the battle flag of a rebellious nation, the Confederate States of America, a symbol of hatred and bigotry, was hoisted through the halls of that hallowed building. I remember being so very scared. 
Well, I can't speak for Stephanie. I imagine she was too. She grabbed my hand and held it tight as we watched the immense unfold that day. That simple act of grabbing my hand was something that I remember now more prolifically than the grim details of January 6, 2021. It reminds me of lines by Nikita Gill, everything is on fire. But everyone I love is doing beautiful things and trying to make a life worth living, and I know I don't have to believe in everything, but I believe in that. The Lord is my shepherd. And one of the greatest gifts, Sunshine Cathedral, that I want you to hear today is that the Lord has given us fellow sheep and a sheepfold here in this place by which we know how to do life together. So that when you get scared, when you get down, when you feel out, someone can hold your hand. Someone can grab your hand and bring you back into reality and you can feel and know that you are not alone and that most importantly, you are loved through it all. There is nothing nothing. Don't let anyone tell you that there is anything that can separate you from the love of God. Not even the things that other churches believe can keep you from God's love for you. And the beauty of this is that those churches cannot control. They think they can. They grip so hard with their hands, but they realize they aren't even holding yours. The world is burning But as someone grabs your hand, you realize God is not done yet. And as we walk through the fire, we will not be burned. Let me prove my point. I promise I'll sit down. (laughs) That very next month, February 2021, after the world seemed to have fallen apart, two daughters came to live with us through the gift of adoption. In fact, tomorrow is the three-year anniversary of their adoption decree by the state of North Carolina. The world may be burning. We may be hurling towards something we know not yet what we see. But then I see my family, and I see worship services like this, And I know we're going to prevail. We have the ability to extinguish the flames. We can hold each other's hands and walk through it together. God has not brought us this far to leave us here alone. So what do you do with all this? Let me challenge you to do something. I hope that this week, if you're comfortable, and I know some of you might not be comfortable with this, hold hands with someone. Though Stephanie has never said this about me, my daughters often remark that my hands get sweaty with theirs, and I wonder if it's theirs, but I'm not going to argue with them. Uh, As we're crossing the street, they say, my hands are sweaty, my hands are sweaty. Well, we've got to hold hands to cross the street, right? We've got to be safe together. And then I think, well, if you've ever had kids, you know how precious and fleeting those moments are that they actually want to hold your hand. How precious is that? Yet when my time is committed to history, when this is all said and done and I am in the grave, I hope it will be said of me that I held the hands of those that I loved. Not only that, I hope it will be said of me that I held the hands of the poor, the disenfranchised, the weary, and the dying. I hope it will be said that I held the hands of my wife and my kids because all of this is practice. All of this is practice for what's coming because one day, off in the distance, our shepherd will take our hand too. The shepherd of the sheep will take us to a table much like this one that has been prepared for us since before the dawn of time. God will lead us to to pastures fair and green spaces that do not lose their luster and there we will find rest because God's got our hand but for now we cling to each other we hold fast to that which is good and we hate what is evil because by our hand holding and our clinging to one another we show this world we show this reality this present moment, 
what it can and should be and indeed what it must be. There is power in hand-holding. Thanks be to God. Amen.